Hello internet and welcome once again. This is your soul uh, broadcasting via steamit.com and a variety of other channels online. So recently we've seen the continuation of the online kind of censorship, let's say, um, agenda, which has resulted in Alex Jones, the alleged conspiracy theorist, wingnut stroke researcher stroke salesman, um, basically being banned from YouTube, Facebook and iTunes. Uh, as far as I know, he's still and his group are still broadcasting on Twitter and probably some other places. So this is kind of unprecedented in the sense that higher profile people tend to not be targeted in that way. And uh, it seems to have come on the back of some claims that were made about him regarding things that he said about Sandy Hook school shooting and also perhaps other topics which haven't really been made publicly clear at this point i know that it's been said that he broke um hate speech rules uh, and potentially uh, inciting violence and things like that which are against the policies of some of these social networks uh, i don't know exactly what he said because nobody's told me but um i do know that a few months ago he got some strikes on one of his or a few of his videos i think um and it was claimed that he was breaking certain um, policies which I happened to, at that time to be looking into those same subjects and I happened to see that video that got taken down one of them and actually no the claims made against him as far as I understand as far as I remember were not true they were not correct they were saying that he said things which he hadn't said and and he put a video um, a video up the next day saying he was going to go uh, talk to his lawyers and bring a court case and stuff I don't know what happened with that but I know myself I've been censored on um, Facebook and it happened yesterday actually unexpectedly I made a post to a Steam, I made a link, just a comment under a normal thread, nothing high profile, just to a friend. Hey, by the way, he was talking about censorship on Facebook. I said, hey, by the way, just made this post on Steamit about Alex Jones and censorship and things. And, uh, and why Steamit, oh, no, actually the post was about why Steamit's a good choice. Why, why people should leave Facebook and go to Steamit because it's uncensored. Uh, and then within a few minutes that post had been completely deleted. Uh, just not there and I asked my friend hey did you delete this no didn't post it again so I posted it again and then he saw it but the point is censorship is real it does happen on social networks it's not just a matter of them legitimately enforcing policies they they do I've seen it many times they do deliberately censor and shut down topics of conversation which whoever it is that's doing it whether it be the people that own the corporations or the government via these corporations uh, whatever the subject is they don't want people hearing about it for whatever reason they do shut stuff down you're not going to find out about that until you actually personally get involved with researching these subjects and probably actually spreading information about them. Only then are you going to really realise the extent to which um, censorship is, is real and happening on social networks. Another example um, uh, of this kind of... Well, it's just something that came to my mind. Basically, back back when we had the uh, Mexican oil spill disaster um, in the Gulf of Mexico, um, I was helping out with one of the groups there who was trying to help get information out about what was really going on from witnesses on the ground and to try and get help to people on the ground. And we were heavily infiltrated there by BP agents um, working for BP, actively trying to just distract everyone, attacking people, everything you could think of. And eventually it came out that some of them were identified as being employees of BP. My point is this stuff does happen. And so when it comes to Alex Jones being um, controlled, let's say, via corporate narratives, um, I'm a bit disturbed, to be honest. I mean, I would expect that to happen to him. It's happened to lots of people. But what I'm disturbed most by is the amount of comments I'm seeing, which may or may not be real people, basically saying, yeah, Alex Jones is evil. He's, you know, look at what he did to the children's parents from Sandy Hook. Uh, even though, as far as I know, it wasn't him that did anything. He was just basically relaying information and his beliefs, um, which apparently then led to other people then going on and um, attacking and harassing these people, which I don't think he would stand by and say that's a good thing. Maybe he did, I don't know. But um, but the point isn't about him anyway. The point I'm making is not about him or whether or not it's right or wrong for him particularly to be taken out of these websites. The point I'm making is, A, it is possible for anyone to be silenced on these networks and it's a bit disturbing how many people just jump behind that as if it's a perfectly good thing because these corporations are obviously good and safe and there's nothing wrong with what they do and they can be trusted even though these people have never met the people that run the corporations and so on and have no real reason to think that they should be trusted. It's completely illogical, but um, there's that side to it. But then there's the other side, which is that 
I think is in a way as important, if not more important, which is that I think Alex Jones has done the world a bit of a disservice by his kind of circus master, over the top performing um, about very serious subjects. And in the beginning, when I first started listening to him, was around about 2005. He was, all I knew about him really was that he had made some documentaries touching on 9-11 and some other subjects, which I was just starting to get interested in researching at that time. And I found some of his documentaries actually to be quite good, quite neutral in a way, didn't seem to be particularly biased to me. He put forward good evidence, good good imagery, um, and he told a story which I still think needs to be heard by more people. And I didn't have any problem with him at that point. I, I could tell he wasn't the best researcher, he wasn't completely... Um, neutral to be honest but I could also sense that he was probably looking in some good places that not enough people were looking at. Fast forward a few years and he's made this kind of media empire selling products and I do feel that he's crossed the line in a few places where um, he just basically is trying to become like a shock jock trying to trigger people and get more viewers and you know he's, perhaps he just thinks that's the way to do things he thinks that competing with CNN and mainstream um, platforms is the way to get his voice heard so he has to constantly get more views and so on um, I don't personally agree with that I think the truth you know basically should be enough you should only need to speak about the truth you can deal with it in a kind of scientific way logical way rational way that it's not that you're blocking out emotions, but that you're you're allowing there to be a balance where you aren't um, kind of just waffling on for hours, which I'm trying not to do now, which he tends to do a lot and, and never really getting to the point and never um, making a reliable case for many of the points that he's making. Um, there's lots of examples where he's he's come out with stories and people have caught onto it in the public eye. And they've re- they've reposted his rants because they seem so insane. The, one of the famous ones was about where he's ranting about gay frogs, saying that companies or I don't know exactly what he was saying because I haven't listened to it for a long time. But it was along the lines of that the government or whoever it is are basically poisoning humans with these chemicals that turn us into transgendered entities and females. Uh, and people found that completely ridiculous talking about gay frogs and all this stuff. Um, but as you'll see in a minute in my whistleblower series on Steam It, which I'm about to go through post post by post, which I've been posting for quite a long time, you'll see actually there is a genuine whistleblower who is a professor um, from the University of California who did research paid for by Syngenta, a very large um, agricultural chemical company, to analyse whether or not their um, uh, products harmed amphibians he was an expert in amphibians and he found that actually yes they did turn turn certain frogs and other amphibians and then later on other people found also other animals changed their gender from male to female for example um and there was a big court case because it turned out that the company actually was harassing him and trying to shut him down and buy him off and silence him and threaten literally physically threaten him and his family to stop this research being published and it all came out in court cases and the notes from the company were, were actually part of that court case and it was shown that yes they actually did write down notes saying that they were going to shut him down and harass him and try and discredit him when all he'd done was um, produce scientific studies which as I understand it without having looked at this 100% um, seem to be valid and certainly there's a lot of um, exposure that he's had which um, um, Many people have had ample opportunity to pull him apart and so far it seems like only a small number of um, government related kind of entities have tried to discredit him. Um, it seems like other studies have, have confirmed what he's saying. But the point is, Alex Jones takes something which is a valid story, it's a real story, real science involved, um, and turns it into this rant and then people only hear the rant, they don't look at the science, they don't listen to the whistleblower and it makes anybody who then talks about that story seem crazy because they've been told that the story's crazy, Alex Jones is crazy, um, so anyone who talks about it is crazy. Well, this is a big problem because Alex Jones talks about many valid, what I would, what you could call conspiracies, remembering that conspiracy is itself a crime in America and other places. It's not just a, a word invented to describe crazy people. Conspiracy literally means two or more people coming together in secret usually to agree to commit crimes. That's basically the basic definition of what conspiracy means. So conspiracy theory is an idea about people doing that. And if you think about it, police are conspiracy theorists. They And lots of people are. We have to have an analysis running of other people in society to know whether or not what they're doing is good or bad or and so on. It's not. It's completely normal to think about theories of conspiracy. Maybe dysfunctional to focus on that and obsess about it and just invent them when there's no evidence. It certainly is. Does he do that? Probably. Sometimes, yes. Um, but at the same time, 
there are many valid conspiracies which he has looked into and and I feel that it's it's really causing a problem by people just associating these ideas with him and not looking at the real whistleblowers. So what I want to do now is take you through some of the posts that I've posted on Steemit who are valid whistleblowers. Many of them um, are government people, you know, media people, um, doctors, professors, you name it pretty much, they're in there. So let's have a look. So here we are. This is the very first post I made. It's quite a long time ago now. Um, and this one is basically covering um, pharmaceutical industry and if we scroll down um, he's talking about the corruption of the, of the pharmaceutical industry and the way that um, the companies will go to almost any lengths certainly in America to buy off doctors um, and as you as you hear if you listen to this video um, there's several whistleblowers in here from from the medical industry uh, well, this guy went on to become a lawyer to actually fight the legal um, the medical industry he used to be a salesman as I recall for one of the big companies they realise that it's all it's so unbelievably corrupt. Uh, I think it's him who tells the story of basically buying off um, doctors with cocaine, prostitutes, you name it, basically to get them to prescribe expensive drugs to the patient, patients so that the drug company makes massive profits. Um, there's several people in this video, um, I'll turn the sound off here, several people, whistleblowers basically, from different, um, different walks of life and... Um, it's worth watching. So this is a real item. This is why I chose to open this series with this one. Um, different. I think that, one, that guy actually worked as a as a technical person, um, and then some of these other people worked as uh, actual sales reps. So these are valid examples of whistleblowing. There was, I think, at least one of these resulted in a massive um, Quitam legal case and lots of compensation, as far as I understand it. I don't know all the details of this, but. Um, certainly this is valid information, from my perspective anyway. Um, so, if we have someone like Alex Jones covering this, you know, he's probably going to be turning it and saying, oh yeah, and this corporation's owned by this person, that person who, like George Soros or whoever, he, whoever it is he can bring into it, maybe they actually are. But he will always try to weave in this story with a whole bunch of other stories that these whistleblowers themselves don't really have any insight into they're not saying those things they're giving you precise information from their own personal life about experiences that they've had within their industry and so on and if you take that information and then try and weave it into your own narrative um you're doing them a disservice that some of these people are risking their lives literally to actually come out and tell you these things and and i think it's important that we listen to them basically so going to the next one dr uh, udo ulf kutter if I, hopefully i pronounced that correctly um <clears throat> Uh, he was, if I remember correctly, it says here, yeah, editor of one of Germany's main daily newspapers, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Um, and he actually passed away shortly after blowing the whistle, but he was on RT News um, here basically saying, I was paid by the CIA to lie, to twist the news in the American government's favour. And he basically says that pretty much all of the other reporters and journalists he knows of were also paid off and bought by the CIA. Um, which is a pretty major thing. I mean, he's, he's a, an editor of one of the biggest newspapers in Germany telling you he's paid by the CIA to lie about major news stories. And not only that, that basically so are all the other reporters. And then uh, not long after this, um, he died of a heart attack. And I've just gone on to mention here, there's a video here from, I think, the 1970s where they were talking in, in Congress, basically the CIA openly admitted to having a gun which could cause a heart attack in someone else which would be undetectable. He died of a heart attack. So... This is not fringe conspiracy, this is mainstream news. This is a high-ranking, high-profile person in Germany telling you things that he's risking his life to tell you, and then he dies. Um, next one, number three. Susan Lindau, she was a CIA operative, uh, an asset, as she would call herself. Um, this is a long story, I won't tell you all of it, but basically she was part of the group who was um, communicating for the American government with the Iraqi government around the time of 9-11 and the world uh, and the Iraq war. And she basically says that um, she was seeing firsthand how George Bush and the other members of the American establishment there were engineering um, conflict. They were refusing opportunities to create peace. And basically she then actually got arrested um, and put in like a military prison. And they tried to drug her basically to the point where she, sh she wouldn't have been able to say anything. She would have just been gone from the world. And thankfully, by the skin of her teeth, in a way, she had a lucky call by the judge that's heard her case and 
people on the outside helping her, um, she actually got out. But they did everything they could to uh, try and silence her. This is a massive story. Almost pro nobody's probably heard of this woman. Um, definitely, she should be heard. 9/11 um, is one of the easily one of the biggest and most exposed um, inside jobs, let's say, or um, false flag attacks ever in the whole history of the world, as far as I'm aware of. It's so much evidence surrounding it that most people who talk about it that I've heard don't even acknowledge they know exists, let alone rebut or anything like that. I've spent years looking at this and I can point you to a long list of bits of evidence that I've never seen rebutted and that really massively changed the perspective of what went on that day. Uh, and I should point out that when on this day I was working for a company making banking software, some of our clients were in the towers and died, as far as I'm aware. Um, I felt threatened at that time because I was in a, a financial area and I, I, you know, for as far as I was concerned, you know, maybe I was going to get attacked next. And I don't forget things like that in a hurry. And basically, if I start finding lots of evidence showing me that the mainstream narrative of such an event is false, including that from 2000 plus architects and engineers stating on paper, risking their reputation to say there is absolutely no possible way that the Twin Towers could have collapsed in the way that the government says they collapsed. The NIST report is bogus. And then we look at Building 7, which also came down, which wasn't even hit by planes. It's just there's so much is ridiculous. And, and I really recommend everyone listen to Susan Lindauer um, because she is one of the few real American heroes that I've seen of the last decade um, for doing what she's done. <coughs> Next one. Um, this is a um, female from Belgium or Holland, is it? Sorry, Holland, uh, near, the, near the Belgian border, I think. Uh, who admits on camera that her husband was part of a gang involved in the ritual killing of children and that the Dutch royal family was involved and she's seen George Soros there and numerous other people she goes into graphic detail she does not seem insane to me in any way whatsoever um, and we have this other reference to um, the um, other cases of um, acknowledged basically child murder and, uh, that happened in Belgium just on the border there Marc Dutro satanic kind of abuse um, Never heard anything more from her since. Um, she says she tried to go to the police. The police basically did nothing. Maybe she's... I don't know. I don't know where she is. Never heard from her. This should be a big story. Never heard anything about it again. This is a whistleblower people should listen to. Find out. Do a bit of research. Find out if it's true or not. Um, again, most people never heard of these people. And it, that in itself is a crime. Um, so here we have uh, Chip Tatum. Basically a CIA agent um, who was a pilot during the Vietnam War, very highly skilled pilot, and he uh, then got involved in flying drugs, cocaine, for the CIA. And uh, he says that he actually saw um, Bill Clinton. Clinton was involved in the smuggling, and uh, the only reason he's alive, he says, is because he kept certain records, which he knows that um, the people that would be threatening him and killing him know that if he released them, they'd be in deep trouble. So he's basically got... Um, a kind of insurance in that in the notes that he kept but another person definitely worth listening to does not seem crazy in any way very um well no more crazy than the average person who's been in the military and killed loads of people but uh he does at least seem to be coherent in what he's saying and provides fairly consistent retelling of the events um and he's not certainly not the only cia agents to have come out saying that bill clinton was involved in cocaine smuggling there's actually more later on in the series uh, in fact, in the next post, so um, here we have um, Terry Reid, who I think died. Um, not too sure of the comment, um, of what comment I would make about that. It's been a while since I studied this. Um, but he also talked about the same subject uh, with the what's called the MENA connection, which is MENA, Arkansas, where uh, Bill Clinton was the governor at the time and how he was also aware that cocaine was being flown in there and guns, and I think it related to the... Um, Sandinista gun running thing with Oliver North and all that as well. You see one of these videos has gone missing. Here's uh, Alex Jones actually interviewing him. So this was back when Alex Jones was, in my opinion, doing good work um, before he sort of lost the plot. Um, so here we have an alleged MI5 microwave weapons specialist. Um, I've seen some documents he's put out, scientific studies and things that it's signed with his name on. Um, He's put a lot of a fair, a fair amount of interviews and data out, basically demonstrating that um, there's been a lot of microwave weapons research done against people illegally. It says here, for example, targeting the poor, certain religious groups, um, actually also against military and police for different reasons, um, pregnant women, psychiatric patients, basically to find out what what 
microwave weapons are capable of. And he says that certain frequencies have been used to create heart attacks, all kinds of different illnesses, and can recreate numerous different psychological and health problems remotely using microwaves. And, he, you know, he's basically tried to do everything that he can to protect people and expose this, um, but he's not a... Um, He's not a social media type of person. He's not a media personality as such. So most people have never heard of him. But there's a few interviews with him here. Um, definitely worth listening to him. Uh, again, a scientific kind of guy. He can point you in a massive list of studies and papers that relate to what he's talking about. I don't think he's messing around. Um, I've never seen him properly debunked. So definitely will be another one to listen to. Um, yeah, so next one. Um, so this comes back to what Alex Jones um, exposed in the Bohemian Grove in California, uh, which is basically this cult group of people, including presidents and leaders of major um, corporations and so on, who meet annually, if not more more regularly than that, to uh, take part in occult rituals, often involving satanic type practices. In this one, they are basically um, burning an alleged effigy of a child and in, this is called the cremation of care, which basically means they are running a ritual to um, symbolically dispose of care. In other words, to become careless, uh, which is not really what you want for people who are running a government or large corporations, in my opinion. Uh, here's photos that were released of them cross-dressing in there. And um, here you can see Ronald Reagan and uh, President Nixon in the Redwood Forest there at Bohemian Grove. Uh, so Alex Groans, Jones actually, um, Alex Groans, <laughs> Alex Jones actually infiltrated Bohemian Grove here, and you can see in this footage um, some of the ritual. If we skip through to it, where is it? Here. So he got some grainy footage. Basically, I don't know if you can hear that or not, but showing uh, robed figures by a lake um, going through this ritual with flames and stuff, and. And then you can see um, interviews with George Bush and other people basically tacitly admitting that they are part of that group. So I don't think the average person is going to be too happy to find out that um, all these you know, uh, politicians and so on are doing this kind of thing behind the scenes whilst attempting to appear to be good upstanding members of the community. Here's another whistleblower talking about how he actually um, participated in the abduction and murder of a child at Bohemian Grove in the past and he's coming straight out with it. All of these subjects so far, I think, are major issues that should be looked into and can't just be hand-waved away and saying, oh, it's all crazy conspiracy theory. This is real testimony from and direct evidence in many cases of these things happening. And only basically people who are dishonest or delusional would say, well, we can't look at that because it's a conspiracy theory and it's from the Internet, as if somehow information becomes invalid because it's on the Internet. Yet yeah, most information is published on the Internet. Ridiculous. So, number nine. Uh, this is a US military officer, Scott Bennett, um, who was part of the, is a major, as I recall, in the uh, psychological operations department of the US military, working at some point with uh, Washington directly in the government and command and so on. Um, he says basically through the um, <clears throat> course of his work, he came to find out that, um, well, he actually got sent to prison as a result of uh, sort of going against his bosses, basically. Uh, as I recall, I don't remember every last detail of it at the moment, but he says that when he was in there, uh, he started exposing um, kind of corruption and crime and things like that within the military and the funding and the government. And when he went into the uh, prison, he by chance was in the same cell as someone else who was in there for a similar thing. And they started talking and it turns out this other person had proof of the CIA directly funding ISIS via Swiss banking cartels for a long time. And uh, and so he went into graphic detail exposing that. And uh, you can see here also is him talking to a member of French uh, Secret Services, allegedly as well, on these subjects. Um, I don't fully support his positions on a lot of things. Uh, he has a very militaristic kind of view on things that I don't agree with. But I'm not going to argue with his whistleblower testimony. That's something for people to research on their own. He has a book called Shell Game. I haven't read that, but... Um, again, this is something that people definitely should have heard about. If we had a free press and an honest press that wasn't biased and controlled by the government and so on, everyone would know about every single one of these stories. And yet most people have never heard of any of them, probably. Uh, right, so here we have the economic hitman, John Perkins. Uh, basically, he worked for the World Bank, as I recall, um, as part of teams that were, let's say, targeting governments with... Um, 
outlooks which weren't in alignment with the American policy and with the World Bank's policy. So if a country somewhere, let's say in South America, were to elect a government that these bankers decided were um, in contradiction to what they wanted, then they would send these jackals in, as he called them, uh, and an economic hitman to go and kind of give the new president or prime minister or whatever uh, an offer they couldn't refuse, um, a contract in one hand and a pistol in the other, and basically saying, you do what we say or you're going to die. Um, so he, after a few years of doing this, he, you know, his conscience got the better of him and he said, I can't do it anymore. And he did a tour of South America apologising to people in Ecuador and other countries. Um, and a film was made about his life and just demonstrating um, that this is really what's going on behind the scenes. Far from a lot of these countries collapsing or, you know, the politics being involved necessarily being a terrible thing, although I'm not advocating any, any particular form of, of politics. But in many cases, the reason why these com countries have such problems is not because of what they themselves are doing. It's because of external pressure on them by corporations and banks um, who are basically trying to control them and take their resources. Uh, so, number 11. Um, this is, as I recall, um, yeah, at this time when I wrote this, I didn't know the name of this whistleblower. Um, he was an anonymous whistleblower on UK Column. Um, and at the moment, his name is escaping me. It will come back to me probably, but he, I think he appears later on in this series. But he basically is saying, he's describing how um, John Ledger, that's his name, yeah. Um, uh, he's describing how he was basically in the employment of the UK police to protect children from child sexual exploitation. And he started getting attacked by his bosses for being actually too good at his job. Uh, and it turns out that they were basically, some of them involved in the gangs of, of child abuse. Uh, his own bosses, top of the police, and uh, as far as he's concerned, that's what's happening. They physically threatened him, um, and he goes into graphic detail of things that he did to try and protect protect children um, and the barriers that he came up against um, as a result of corruption in the police. I mean, this is mind-blowing. This is just... I mean, it, if you were to come out to people in a bar or in a club who didn't, who'd never thought about these things, and you would say, hey, by the way, the police are infested with child rapists who are not protecting the children are actually part of the teams abducting them you know a lot of people will just look at you like you're nutty you've taken too many drugs or whatever but here you've got a guy who is basically someone who worked in the police his whole life in that career telling you exactly that so it would help if people had a, a, a more open mind to these things instead of just jumping on the ridicule bandwagon because it's convenient so this is the plutonium files this is basically um uh, a case where Research was done on soldiers and other people um, in the 40s, 50s and onwards uh, using um, radioactive material to find out whether what the effects would be. And it was all done secret, illegally. Non-consenting people were basically made extremely ill and died as a result of the US government's basically secret programs of testing dangerous chemicals on them. Um, and this came out as a result of this researcher um, doing a lot of work to uncover this information over a lot of period, long period from uh, sort of well-buried documents in various annals of government and military records and so on <clears throat> another massive story that probably no one's heard of most people this is one of the most amazing ones again a lot of people have heard of this but still the average person completely in the dark about it um uh, carol quigley was an ivy league historian in the 1960s quite well known and um worked in harvard as i recall uh and basically he was a very mainstream kind of historian he was quite almost part of the establishment really but by chance maybe through the people he knew um he was asked to write a book about the history of kind of the modern world using access to records held by a certain secret society which he calls the network and uh apparently this is a really interesting story apparently the idea was that he would not publish the book that he wrote publicly it was meant to be just for the private reading of these people involved in this network and the book actually got published for a brief period for about six or nine months it was published by penguin until those involved suddenly realized that this had happened and they had the book pulled um but because it was out for a certain amount of time it has been possible to get the book and because it was withdrawn most people have never read it and also because the book is absolutely huge um and most of it is boring history information, not really world changing. And uh, 95% of it is dry stuff. Most people never realise that the 5% of it that's explosive is super explosive. And it actually explains how this network of people have basically created fake democracy around the world. The democracy is not real. It's just a ruse designed to um, 
uh, give the people the impression that they have a say in how society is run, whereas in reality it's all very controlled by a very small number of people. It started out by Cecil Rhodes, um, one of the original kind of plunderers of Africa for the British Empire, um, who was obsessed with English people being the most superior humans on earth, and he left trillions potentially in current currency uh, in his will to create um, secret social networks and basically a kind of master race, uh, which would mean that Anglo-Saxons dominated the world behind the scenes. Um, this is not someone in the bedroom coming up with a theory, this is one of the leading historians of the day writing a huge book on it in graphic detail. Still, no, most people never heard of it. Uh, right, so yeah, Craig Murray, so he was uh, an ambassador for um, it says here Uzbekistan and um, this is a more kind of um, even in my mind it's not such a well known case I'm just refreshing my memory of it but I know that it's to do with um, weapons of mass destruction and the lies that were told to start the war in Iraq um, <clears throat> and how he basically exposed some of the lies that Tony Blair and others were, were saying um, as I recall and openly talking about it which is kind of unusual in the sense that um most of the people who seem to be involved in these crimes which are obviously crime the, you know after all of the investigations that were done government and non-government um it's pretty clear to anyone paying attention that this was all basically crimes against humanity in terms of launching this illegal war but it's quite unusual for government people to come out and actually admit to that and he is certainly one who has uh so here's another interesting one this was a kgb defector from the mid 80s um, what's his name? Yuri Bres Bresnyov or something like that. Besmanov, that's it. Uh, he's basically telling you in this long video the techniques that the Soviet KGB were using to twist the psychology of America, Britain and other countries to kind of weaken the country from the inside, to get people to believe in certain things um, and for that to then cause the nation to become much weaker and easier to be controlled by Russia. He gives examples of... Um, things that are kind of main talking points today where people say oh it's our right to be transgenders it's our right to be gay it's our right to have all different sexualities a long list maybe even a hundred different gender designations and here back in the 80s he was saying oh by the way the Soviets have been trying to infiltrate western countries for a long time to get them to think of things like this as being a good idea so that the family unit will collapse and basically you know make it much easier for Soviet um, infiltration uh, definitely worth listening to as well um okay so yeah this is someone from the the um serious project as i recall he's interviewed down here uh, by stephen greer so he's now passed on william uh, pavlek he was in 1960s a computer programmer for us uh, air force uh, and other kind of uh, military type groups i think and basically he was making security systems for the us government and at a certain point he started finding various top secret programs he was um, kind of coming into contact with and basically he encountered a type of crystal implant which I'm reading here could be read via focus beam remotely at a distance of up to 120 kilometers away so you can implant this into a person it's very tiny and basically from over on well over 100 kilometers away it can be read uh, Siemens have built billions of these chips and and this guy is a serious guy if you listen to him he's not stupid he's not mucking around um, and this was meant to be released only after he died because he didn't want to have any fallout from telling everyone about it. Uh, definitely worth watching. Um, it, basically, if you've got the ability to produce billions of tiny little crystals, which can be inserted into people one way or another, and then read and potentially send signals to them and cause these chips to do things, that's quite serious. You know, I mean, again, it's not some crazy, kooky conspiracy theory. This is a guy who worked on the projects. He's a smart guy. Uh, just listen to him. That's my advice. So this is a story from Africa. Um, this was a radio show host over there who uh, basically went on a campaign against the polio vaccine uh, in his country, not because he thought all vaccines were bad, but because he learned that they were giving the wrong vaccine to people. They were giving the live vaccine, which had already been basically banned in America and other countries. They were still giving it to children out there and children were dying. Large numbers of children were dying. And the government tried to have him up on charges of sedition, which caused, which would have brought about um, the death penalty. So they literally tried to kill him for saying, hey, you're using the wrong vaccine. In the end, uh, they caused government, they brought government um, scientists in to debate him live on air because people were sort of writing effectively as they tried to shut him down. 
and they realized they couldn't have uh, they couldn't just get rid of him quietly so they had to sort of try and prove that he was wrong and in the end the government scientists ended up arguing with each other and they didn't know what the hell they were talking about and he came out the winner um and really it's only because people rioted and shut streets down that he's still alive i think they, he did have attempts on his life no matter what you think about vaccines, no matter what you've heard from XYZ person about vaccines that you think may or may not be true, I still think you should listen to this guy. Um, I don't think he's bullshitting, to be honest with you. Um, and it's a very important story. Uh, I've never heard him be successfully rebutted by anyone. Uh, right, so here's another one in the same air as the first video, uh, which is this lady is a sales rep, basically, for drug companies um and she openly says hey we were trained to lie we were trained to mislead people we were trained to basically just sell as much as we could without any real concern for well-being or people's health uh, number 19 so this is george bush's jr's own chief economist so this is a person that george bush jr had in his own government um around the time of the iraq war and what and 9-11 uh, and he was his chief economist and basically he did a lot of research into 9-11 after he left uh, the government and realized that George Bush, in his own words, was a criminal responsible for this crime uh, committed against the American government and the American people and the world. And he went on around the world basically telling everyone, hey, the Pentagon was hit by a cruise missile, there's no plane, that's why you've never seen a plane hitting the, in the, in the Pentagon, and why the CIA took all the security cameras from the hotels and buildings around the Pentagon and won't let anyone see them. It's not because it was a matter of national security and you can't see what the Pentagon looks like, it's because there was no plane that hit the Pentagon, it was a cruise missile, and lots of other things he talks about as well. Um... He's not necessarily the best person to listen to, in my opinion, regarding 9-11, but it is worth listening to him just on the basis that he actually knew George Bush uh, and is saying that George Bush is a war criminal. So, um, yeah, so this is uh, Donald Trump's biographer. So, um, Tony Schwartz, he wrote The Art of the Deal, the famous book that's allegedly about Trump, that many people sort of came to think they knew Trump as a, as a result of reading. Um... As it turns out, he says here in the Oxford Union and other places before Trump was being elected, hey, by the way, um, yeah, I wrote that book. It's all lies. Um, the character portrayed by about Donald Trump there is not real. It's not how he actually is. I was paid a lot of money to make him look a certain way. And basically, he's got the memory of a goldfish. He's completely untrustworthy. Um, he's very childish in a lot of ways, unstable, and you shouldn't trust him and you shouldn't let him be the president. And this is his own biographer. Interestingly, his other biographer... Um, said more or less the same thing as well. So here we have, um, as I recall, yeah, Dr. Dr. Jeffrey Shaler. Um, he's winning an award here for psycho psychiatry, uh, and he openly says in his um, uh, acceptance speech for this award that basically psychiatric treatment is worse than prison. In prison, they do not judge how long people should be deprived of liberty on the basis of what they think about themselves in the world. In a mental institution, of course, this is the case. If you don't think about yourself and the world correctly, you'll be punished longer. So he's literally saying there's no scientific backing behind psychiatry and psychology a lot of the time, um, and yet it's being used many times as if it is completely all proven. And um, as it says here, CV, CV is 31 pages long, includes a wealth of books, published papers and essays spanning 45 years. He was editor-in-chief of the international peer-reviewed journal Current Psychology for nine years. He's not a lightweight, he's not a random guy in his basement, he's one of the people making decisions about psychiatry and psychology. Here he says, it's all corrupt, basically. Uh, moving on, so here we have Dr. David Kennedy, he's a dentist, um, long-time dentist, and basically he's pointing out that the science surrounding fluoridation of water is far from settled. Um, in fact, a, a huge wealth of information has been published showing you that, for many different reasons, um, fluoridation is a bad idea from lowering of iq to the fact that it's um non-consenting medication of people which is fundamentally unethical and against the basic foundations of medicine dna damage and all kinds of things he's talking about in here again many people don't often hear the fact that there are actual um, professors and doctors with a lot of science behind them talking about these things um it would be good if more people listen to them so here we come to what is potentially one of the most controversial things on here, I suppose, and least understood, least listened to, least researched. Um, this guy basically was a lecturer in Leicester University, and he claims that um, in the course of him studying fluoride and endocrine disruptors, he, he basically found out that there were depopulation programs um, that have been running for a long time, which originally, um, he says, 
were um, based around creating war. So World War One, World War Two, and other big wars, which many people have pointed out, have, do appear to have been engineered artificially. Um, he's saying basically they were created to lower the population by the people who think of themselves as kind of like farmers of the humans on planet Earth, the elite and so on. And then when nuclear weapons got invented, they couldn't do that anymore because it was too risky because there's a chance that nuclear war is going to happen. So they had to find other ways to lower the population. And he says that water fluoridation was the main way that, that has been found to do that. And basically, fluoridation has an effect on the um, reproductive organs of humans and the endocrine system such that their fertility drops. And he basically put quite a lot of work into looking at the fertility rates of many different countries. In fact, I think all of the countries and looking at when fluoridation occurred. In, in terms of time and looking at what happened to the to the fertility of the people after that and in every case pretty much i think the um, fertility nose dives after fluoridation is introduced and he's making the point that for the people whose job it is to actually look at population reduction professionally openly um, they would never dream of being able to find a policy or a technique that's lowered reproduction to the extent that water fluoridation has so from there if they were deliberately doing it it would be like the biggest success they'd ever had but obviously they would never admit that because water fluoridation is all about making your teeth better um even though um the only possible way that fluoridation can actually improve the health of your teeth is to have it topically applied uh, and if you drink it or have it in your water when you shower it's not going anywhere near your teeth it is going to your body and it causes health problems um yeah so kevin galilei is this guy's name I don't know, I can prove that what he's saying is true or not, but it certainly looks interesting. He's put a huge amount of evidence out in the form of three books. Again, it would be good if we knew about this, hey, so we could all look at it, but most people never heard of it. Um, about two-thirds of the way through the list now. So, um, Phil Schneider. So this is a very interesting case. This guy has passed on now quite a while ago. He claims to, he was a, ge a geologist, structural engineer, and he claims that basically he worked for the US military on deep underground projects. Um, building kind of military bases and very large tunnels that kind of thing and basically at one point they ended up going into an unexpected kind of cavern um, and they found a bunch of extraterrestrials under there who had a fight with some of the um, uh, green berets and soldiers that were there and killed a bunch of green berets and he lost a finger um, in the fight and yeah i don't know if any of that's true but a lot of people think it's true and I don't see what he would gain by lying about it personally. I mean, I don't think he made any money out of it really. And um, yeah, could be true. I don't know. Um, so this is uh, Gary McKinnon, quite well known in Britain as a hacker uh, who hacked NASA a long, a long while ago when they had basically no security on their networks. Uh, and he said that basically they had, I think he said they had no passwords set for the admin account or something like that so he just logged on got their IP address logged on connected and went straight in straight into like quite secret areas of NASA um, and he's and the internet was so slow at that time that he said he basically found like a before and after set of photos um, before and after they've been airbrushed to remove interesting objects from space that they don't want us to know about like buildings on the moon and maybe ET ships and things like that um, but the internet was so slow that he was having real difficulty downloading these images and he got a part way through and then an admin sort of caught him and kicked him off the network. Um, so the US government tried to have him extradited um, and the UK government thankfully basically said no, we're not going to extradite him, which is unusual, normally they would do. Um, he is alleged to have um, like a mental dysfunction so it makes him perhaps not the um, not the nasty enemy of freedom that some people might try to claim that he is and actually just an interested person Asperger's syndrome that's it somebody who um just you know made a bad decision basically from the perspective of the government but um but yeah anyway he says that he did see extraterrestrial vehicles he also said he saw a list um of like the et space uh, sorry the u.s navy space command different officers who were heading up military ships in space and this was bear in mind this was 2002 and they claim they don't even have those now um, and then when you look at this video from the uh, disclosure project 2001 press club conference where they had something like a hundred high-ranking u.s military whistleblowers basically from the air force um navy all different departments um all different sort of wings of government basically saying yeah we lied uh we have got extraterrestrial um vehicles we have had contact with extraterrestrials we make anti-gravity vehicles that are going to far into space and so on we've been doing it for a long time sorry we lied this video on its own is worth watching it's nearly an hour long i think um 
Most people never heard of it. This was meant to go live around the world. It was in the press club and the press had a complete blackout of it. But every single one of these people is giving you a testimony from their own life. Some of these people are very high ranking people. And yet, hey, never heard of it. Most people it doesn't exist. ETs aren't real. It's all from movies. Uh, right. JP Morgan, banking family. Um, bank. Knowingly missold loans and lies, causing the US economy to crash. Um, basically, they, they were very involved with toxic loans. And um, this goes into the fact that the whole concept of loaning and mortgaging is itself criminal and guaranteed to result in um, loss of well-being. Basically, you can't have a mortgage system like this without some people losing. It's impossible. Uh, again, something that nearly everybody seems to be in denial of. Politicians will talk all day long about things relating to money and banking and mortgages, but they'll never really talk about the fact that the entire foundation of money is criminal to begin with, modern money system. Basic math tells you that, but hey, it's all conspiracy theory. Um, oh yeah, Natalie Rose. So this lady was a dominatrix, a prostitute, basically ran a brothel in London, and um, she uh, was friends with George Osborne, the ex-Chancellor of the Exchequer, who um, basically, you know, was into cocaine and um, kinky sex. And he then went on to become the, uh, you know, nearly running the government pretty much. And there's lots of stories here about David Cameron, the Prime Minister as well, doing dodgy things sexually. And it's just, she's explaining how basically these guys are part of this uh, Bullingdon Boys Club, which is like a kind of secret society in a way um and you know that's what's going on behind the scenes it's not just people operating with the best interest of the public in mind it's people operating with their own best interest in mind to fulfill certain agendas for their friends well known for a long time but it's good to hear whistleblower testimony on it uh so here we have kevin ship a cia whistleblower another one who um basically goes into graphic detail mapping out what he calls the shadow government and the deep state um, so these are the various government departments in America who have all different functions relating to security and spying. And he's exposing basically how these connect into uh, major corporations, media corporations, banks and so on. Um, and and how they basically do everything they can to shut down whistleblowers. Um, they're using the power of the government to silence those who try to expose the government's crimes. Um, and he goes on in quite, you can see there's a lot of information here. Um, documenting all the different departments and, and some of the crimes they've done. Um, it says here human rights violations. 475,000 Syrian civilians, 100,000 Syrian military have been killed due to the CIA-backed rebels. 40,000 Chilean civilians disappeared in Pinochet's Chile during a period that the CIA was directly funding those doing the murder and torture. Um, the President of the US has a kill list that can be defined only on behavioural profiling, whereby people are killed based on nothing more than essentially looking like a terrorist. It all sounds like 1984 nightmare material, but here we have somebody um, claiming to have direct inside knowledge of these things and that they're really happening. So here we have UK again, um, tax and uh, basically war crimes. So we've got here Annie Machon, an MI5 whistleblower, acknowledged as a real MI5 whistleblower. We've got John McDonald, an MP, um, and we uh, also have Chris Coverdale, who's a peace activist. I think one of these, I think um, John McDonald was also Speaker of the House, if I remember correctly, in Parliament. I'm not 100% sure, but anyway, they're basically saying that in the, after World War II, um, let's just find the right text so I get this right. Um, right, so, war was declared illegal in 1928, confirmed illegal in 1945, and again in 1970, various laws and UN declaration. No state or groups of states has the right to intervene directly or indirectly for any reason whatever in the internal or external affairs of any other state. Consequently, armed intervention and all other forms of interference or attempted threats against the personality of the state or against its political, economic or cultural elements are in violation of international laws. So this basically means that when Britain and America got involved in the Iraq War and other wars since then, they were breaking their own laws and international law. And that therefore means that basically... Um, because it's a crime, as it says here, to provide means to support genocide, um, a, a war crime, war crimes or crimes against humanity, uh, which it stated that the actions of this government are, therefore, when people are paying tax, they're technically committing a crime of being ancillary to those crimes committed by the government. So they're arguing, here's a, a British politician saying, it's actually illegal for British people to pay taxes. Don't hear about that every day, do you? 
Um, right, so here we have... Um, oh, one of these videos has gone missing, unfortunately. I'll have to find that. Um, oh, E. Howard Hunt, right, yeah. Funny that's gone missing. So we've got two people here. E. Howard Hunt, who should have been here, uh, was a, a quite a well-known CIA a operative who... Um, on his deathbed basically admitted to being part of the team that killed john f kennedy and that the whole thing was an inside job designed for various purposes um they had a lot of people on the ground apparently um multiple teams shooting at kennedy and the evidence backs that up uh, te witness testimony backs that up lots of analysis by lots of people back that up we also have here a testimony from Le lieutenant colonel marvin who says that he was basically trained um, in a secret squad in American military to be part of an assassination team whose job was to execute people in foreign, on foreign soil for the American government. And he started to be asked by people in the American government to assassinate people on American soil, which is against the Constitution, it's illegal. He refused to do that, but he did hear about the actual mission that he was asked to do, which was to assassinate an, an American, um, I think it was a naval psychologist or someone like that, in, in uh, a hospital on American soil. And he later became clear that um, members of his team were probably involved in the assassination of JFK. Uh, and this is a quite a good documentary about this, giving a lot of evidence that most people have never, ever seen. Um, interviews with all kinds of people that were there who knew Kennedy, um, who knew Oswald and so on. Um, painting a very clear picture that he was basically killed by members of the American government and not by some random um, communist sympathiser in the form of uh, Harvey Oswald. Uh, so here we come on to back to the Alex Jones thing again, Sandy Hook, Wolfgang Halbig. Now, I've seen nearly nearly everybody I've seen who says to me, oh yeah, um, the claims about Sandy Hook being a false flag, all this, they're nonsense, um, there's no evidence to it, they've all been debunked. Well, none of them have even mentioned Wolfgang Halbig, who basically was a policeman, then he went on to become an expert in school safety. So his job was to create the policies that kept children safe from school shootings in America. So he's probably one of the most qualified people to look at the Sandy Hook school shooting. And when he did, he found, basically, that there was a massive list of um, anomalies with the case, which, from his perspective, his professional perspective, he didn't have answers to. Why was... Well, there's a long list of them. Um, he tried to get documentation, you know, that he should have been able to get under Freedom of Information Act, just to do with basic things to do with the day, and he couldn't get them. And it just made him dig into it deeper and deeper and deeper. He found numerous records relating to the event are missing. Testimonies don't match up with the timing of videos from police cameras and things like that. Um, uh, he's asked for dash cam footage. He's got the wrong footage being supplied. Um, he makes the point that the condition of the school was so dilapidated and unclean and uncared for. Um, he said he's never seen a school looking so run down. That he thinks it's unlikely it was even an active school. More recently, he said that uh, he's got documentary evidence showing that the food that was being ordered to, to feed the children at the school wasn't even being delivered to that school. It was being delivered to another school in another town. Lots of things like that, which, I mean, any one of these points is a bit kind of iffy. But when you've got a massive list of them next to each other, these are really serious red, red warning flags without even going into some of the more esoteric aspects um, to do with ley lines. And um, all these videos are gone, taken down probably by YouTube. Um uh, yeah, so like the Batman movie, um, I'll read this. There are many other threads relating to Sandy Hook, including the fact that the town appears briefly on a map in a scene from the Batman movie that was playing in the Aurora Cinema shooting a few months prior to the event at Newtown, a movie which included the descendant, a descendant of the evilest man alive, Alistair Crowley, on its production team. His grandson, I think, was, was actually a member of the production team on that Batman movie. Uh, that So basically you've got something connecting... Um, a previous shooting in the Aurora Cinema, the boot movie that was showing in there contained a moment where it basically marked Sandy Hook as a target in it. This is, to, you know, that might seem a bit weird, but if you understand the way that occult groups tend to work, implanting ideas in the subconscious of the public um, for various reasons, according to their belief systems, um, I don't overlook these things, you know, and, and but... But when you've got somebody who, whose job it is to literally fully be able to assess the safety and look into the cases of school shootings and things like that, and he's super unhappy with, with what he's encountering and the resistance he's meeting from people refusing to give him evidence and things like that, the police actually, some police, even though he used to be a cop, police came to his house and threatened him, he says. This is not a small thing. You can't just wave away these kind of people and say they're crazy, oh, because Alex Jones talks about this. 
Listen to him. Listen to what he has to say. He does not in any way come across crazy. He might not agree with everything that you think and or that I think, but he deserves to be listened to. Uh, right, so 32. Here we have Diane Rourke. Um, refreshing my memory. She's another NSA whistleblower, a bit like Edward Snowden, um, who still a lot of people have never heard of, amazingly, um, who basically she found out about some of the same things that Edward Snowden was talking about, unconstitutional spying through cell phones and email monitoring, website trafficking, uh, website traffic monitoring and so on. Um, some of the things she's still not allowed to talk about due to legal restrictions. Um, and this is another one basically worth listening to. She makes some interesting points in here. Um, she basically was attacked again, like most of these whistleblowers have been from within the government, trying to sort of keep the lid on things that, by their own rules, the public should know about. Most people never even heard of Edward Snowden. Still, it seems one of the biggest, best, best known whistleblowers of in recorded history. So, what chance do we have of people knowing about these lesser well-known people who are also making very important statements? Uh, so, here's a more recent one from a few days ago. Um, Mark Dugan was in the military, joined the police, and went to work in Palm Beach. And basically, he found out that lots of police, they were extremely corrupt, um, ranging from a gang who was run within the police who attacked dark-skinned people who had not committed any crimes. They posted photos on Facebook with captions such as, he fell down some stairs. One cop of that team walked around with a hat on saying, punishment. So you've literally got these psychopaths walking around attacking random people because of their skin colour, working for the police. He reported it, nothing happened. They started to attack him. Internal Affairs basically attacked him, the whistleblower, not the people committing the serious crimes. Um... He, he actually has photographs of the head of internal affairs being photographed on a golf course with a naked prostitute snorting cocaine. Um, he says he was um, put on assignment to protect drug gangs instead of actually getting them arrested. Um, and just a general culture of, of violence and extortion. These are the things that researchers into the police in America have been highlighting for years, countless videos showing this happening. And yet apologists and deniers still carry on saying, oh no, this isn't happening, you're just anti-American, blah, 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 blah. Uh, he's actually now had to flee to Russia to escape the problems he's facing. He's had to separate from his family, just like Edward Snowden. Um, and many people say he's a real American hero, uh, but not the American government, apparently. For them, he's uh, you know he's a problem. So the last one in the series, which um, brings us right back to Alex Jones again and the gay frog story. This is Tyrone Hayes, who is the um, professor of uh, integrative biology at University of California, Berkeley. <clears throat> uh, who did all this work into atrazine and showed um, uh, actually there was a hundred million dollar compensation court case against Syngenta, the company that makes atrazine, um, so that water filter com so that water companies could buy filters to filter out atrazine because of its health risks. Um, and he basically was targeted by um, Syngenta and their stooges, um, physically threatened, uh, and he had a real hard time basically, and didn't get a lot of support just for basically doing nothing more than publishing science and refusing to bow down when they told him not to publish it. So yeah, gay frogs do exist. The studies there, numerous studies apparently are there, and it's connected back to atrazine. It's not some crazy um, Alex Jones lunacy trying to sell you anti-gay frog potions or something like that. Look at the whistleblowers. This is the thing. This is what I'm saying. Um, I've put together this big series here. You can easily click on it, easily read all these different blog posts detailing all of these different um, cases. As you can see, some of the videos have gone missing now. I'm going to have to update the links to some of those. Um, but yeah, it'd be great if you would uh, spend some time um, checking these out and maybe sharing them with your friends and getting more awareness in the in the collective mindset of these people because many of them are real heroes. They deserve to be heard and real crimes have been committed against them and humanity. Uh, and we need to wake people up to this instead of having people demonising others just for daring to even mention these subjects, which really is another crime in itself, in my opinion. So anyway, I've talked on long enough. This is quite a long video. It's probably the longest one I've done in a while. Um, I look forward to reading your comments. And um, yeah, let us know what you think about some of these whistleblowers. And uh, let us know if you know of any others that you think should be included in this that are of an equal kind of importance. So until next time, I'm uh, wishing you well and uh, may we all come to know unconditional love and uh, well-being.